Welcome, welcome, patrons, to the first episode of... Ah. Okay, well, y'all had some really good name suggestions. Virdurthala or Shattered Library were some of those popular ones. And although that name does fit the theme of the channel, I have some plans for that name, so I can't actually pick those. So, after reading all the comments, the one that felt right and rolled off the tongue easiest to me was Dr. Nefarious's suggestion of the Book Emporium. So thank you, dear doctor, and welcome everyone to the Book Emporium. Because this is the first episode, I just want to quickly go over the format. First, I'll be giving a summary of what happened in the chapters for this week. And here, if I've gotten any artwork from you guys that is directly related to the story, I'll place it in there. Then will be the discussion section. Going in order of what happens in the chapters, I'll be giving my thoughts and going over comments and anything else you guys sent in. I'll also briefly go over who made what images that I use in the summary section and be sure to link to their accounts in the video description. Because this is the first episode, things will probably feel a little clunky, but that's how all first episodes are, right? Anyway, enough babble. Let's start The Stolen Throne. Chapter 1 the book opens up immediately with the last words of Moria Theron, the rebel queen of Ferelden, as her only son, 18-year-old Merrick Theron, runs into the woods to try and survive. We get his best description of what just happened. Currently, Ferelden is occupied by the Orlesians, who we will find out has been terrorizing the nation. Moria, the rightful heir, has spent her life hiding in the hinterlands and gathering a secret army to fight off the Orlesians to win her land back. Moria has become a symbol of hope for the Ferelden people. She was given word that a large number of bands who were once loyal to Orle wanted to join her cause, and she met them in the dead of night. With these men, her army would be complete and she would win independence for her nation. But it ended up being a trap and Moria and her traveling troop were slaughtered. The only surviving member is Merrick, who is currently being hunted. Eventually, a nameless Orlesian soldier catches up with him. The two struggle, and Merrick manages to kill the man with his bare hands. His first kill is gruesome, hands caked in flesh and blood, and he vomits from the stress of the situation before going off deeper into the woods. We switch perspectives to a young Loghain who hears distant yelling while he is poaching with another bandit named Danon. We get a small glimpse of the Orlesian occupation and how it has affected Loghain. His father was a farmer who tried to keep up with the heavy Orlesian taxes, made up so that the nobles could own the land rather than the commoners. When the next year came and the tax was raised even higher, he refused to pay. The story ends here in that we know that Loghain's family is now living in the wilds of Ferelden with others like them. Loghain and the dim-witted Danon discuss what could be going on in the woods, wondering why a local band would bring so many men in the remote area. They end up finding Merrick, who stumbles out of the woods heavily wounded. Their meeting is cautious, but they soon gain an uneasy trust when Loghain asks who is chasing him, and Merrick responds, or lesion dogs. Despite Danon's objections, Loghain takes Merrick back to their hidden camp, doing their best not to be followed. On the way, Loghain questions Merrick why he is being chased so heavily. Merrick, not knowing if he can trust him, claims that his name is Hiram, that the Orlesians killed a friend of his, and awkwardly states that he has nothing to repay him with. Loghain knows this is a lie, but understands that Hiram is worried he's about to be mugged. But the chapter ends with the three of them still heading back to their secret camp, because Loghain trusts that his gut feeling of saving this man is correct. Chapter 2 Merrick awakens in a simple hut, which is unlike the rest of the tents in the dingy camp town that Loghain lives in. He opens his eyes to find a sister of the Chantery attending to his wounds, which is unusual to find in a Ferelden refugee camp, as the Chantry largely took the side of the Orlesians. This is Sister Alice. She tells Merrick that he has slept for most of the day, and that there is somewhere in the Southrin Hills. The people in the camp follow a man named Gareth McTeer, Loghain's father. Sister Alice gets Merrick talking, to which he admits the one killed was his mother. Merrick also recites a bit of the chant, something that only those with an education would know. Loghain comes in and tells Merrick that his father wants to speak with him. He then leads Merrick through the camp, passing by families and young children playing. Gareth is described looking similar to Loghain, and he begins to question Merrick as to why there were so many Orlees and soldiers hunting him, and if the camp is now in trouble. Gareth then asked if his friend or his mother was killed, letting us know that Sister Alice had been trying to get information from Merrick. When Merrick still doesn't tell the whole truth, Loghain snaps, asking his father to kill Merrick. Gareth stops him, saying that while he isn't telling the truth, Merrick isn't lying either. 
The argument ends with Gareth telling Loghain to find a scouting party that has yet to return and telling his people that they should start packing up. Loghain leaves camp trying to find his missing people. On the way, he meets up with a random horseman. The two exchange weary pleasantries, and the horseman lets Loghain know that the rebel queen is dead, but it's unknown what happened to her son. It's then that Loghain knows who Hiram truly is. We switch back to Merrick, who is sleeping in the hut, Sister Alice nearby keeping watch. Garrus suddenly bursts in, scaring the two, but telling them that soldiers are approaching the camp and they have little time. The older man pins Merrick to the wall and demands answers. Merrick responds that if they just give them to the soldiers, they should be spared. At this time, Loghain comes in, announcing that he knows who Merrick is now, the only heir to the Ferelden throne. Loghain makes a move to kill Merrick, but is stopped by his father. The true struggle with the blade, Merrick confirms his identity, and in a surprise move, Gareth drops to his knees. He explains that he once served Merrick's grandfather and that Merrick is the only hope that Ferelden's have. With Loghain stirring in anger, his father turns to him and asks if he can get Merrick to safety, meaning that Gareth is about to sacrifice the entire camp for a prince. Merrick refuses, as does Loghain, but Gareth asks his son for his word, which he gives. Before they leave, Merrick remembers something his mother told him. What they will give us freely, she had said, is never free for them. Remembering that is the only way we will be worthy of it. He asked if Gareth was ever knighted. He wasn't. On the spot and asking Sister Alice to witness, he knights Gareth McTeer. The gesture isn't lost on him and it's obvious he appreciates it greatly. Before they leave, Gareth's last words to his son are, do your best, to which he replies, of course. Gareth and Sister Alice rush to where the soldiers are attacking the camp, and soon after, Merrick and Loghain run to escape the chaos. Loghain has to drag Merrick away from soldiers murdering innocents, and even though the two meet some resistance out of the camp, they finally rush into the dangerous Kokari wilds. Loghain only stops once when they make it into the woods, and turns towards camp. He can see his father's figure rushing towards the attacking soldiers, the distant cry stopping short. He tugs Merrick in deeper to the forest. Chapter 3 The chapter opens up with Merrick and Loghain running deeper into the Kokari wilds, running well into the next day. Eventually, Merrick has to just stop, which prompts the two to start talking. Loghain informs Merrick that he should be safe and he's leaving him. This frightens Merrick as he doesn't think he could survive alone. The two begin to argue, and it ends with Loghain punching Merrick in the face, and after a bit of discussion, Merrick thanks Loghain for saving him and leaves. After trudging through the wilds a bit, Merrick finds that Loghain has followed him. Loghain tells Merrick that he was touched with what he had said and changes his mind. He agrees to help Merrick get out of the woods, mostly in honor of his father, on two conditions. When they get out, he wants no thanks or reward, and he won't have to call him Your Highness. Merrick agrees, which seems to disappoint him as he was expecting an argument, but the two go off into the woods. For three days they walk. Loghain, despite having every reason to hate Merrick, is having trouble not liking him. The past few days, Merrick has been talking away at anything and everything he can think to pass the time away. The longer they walk, however, Merrick becomes quieter, which Loghain hates how he misses the sound. Because they have come ill-prepared, the damp and cold wilds are slowly freezing the two to death. Wolves come and go, and the two are able to keep them at bay. On the fourth day of walking, Loghain realizes that they are being followed, and Merrick spots two pinpricks of light, elven eyes lighting up in the dark. The Dalish attack and capture Merrick and Loghain with a net, bringing them back to camp. The two wake up in the Dalish camp, tied to a pole, their wounds bandaged and cleaned. After Merrick tries to communicate with them, an elf from the clan goes to speak with them. He asks the two what they were doing in the forest, to which Merrick answers that they were running for safety. The elf informs them that others like them were found in the woods as well, and the elf apologizes that he must take them to Asha Belinar, who we know to be Flemeth, and asks that they should come quietly. Loghain is shaken by this woman because whoever she is, the Dalish are afraid of her. Merrick and Loghain are led hours from the camp to a path, and are told to follow it as the elves leave. They find a clearing with a musty old hut and skeletons hanging from trees. One of them, Loghain recognizes, as Danon, his corpse hanging from a tree like a puppet. At this point, they are greeted by an old woman. Loghain demands to know if she killed Danon, to which the surrounding trees, which are really Sylvans, swoop in to grab him and hoist him up high. 
Merrick, seeing how Loghain's approach didn't exactly work, is polite to Flemeth. She is happily surprised with his manners, and the two begin to talk, and Loghain is set free from the branches. Flemeth knew he would come, but not when. She wants to make a deal. She will lead both of them to safety out of the forest, and in return, she will get a promise from Merrick. Loghain gets snippy, and here we get an interesting bit from Flemeth. She begins to taunt him with his life story, how his mother was assaulted by the Elysians, how Loghain and his father were forced to watch. Loghain yells for her to stop. How she knew these things, we aren't sure, but she tells Merrick something that foreshadows his future. She arched a brow at Loghain. He has quite the estimation of your capabilities, doesn't he? When he said nothing, she turned to gaze intensely at Merrick. Keep him close and he will betray you, each time worse than the last. Merrick acknowledges this as well as accepts her deal. Chapter 4 Loghain and Merrick spent the night outside of the hut, and Merrick goes into the hut to discuss the deal. He remains there for hours, and when Loghain starts to get worried, he emerges. Merrick seems shaken by what happened and doesn't respond to Loghain's questions about what had gone on. While Merrick sleeps, Loghain recovers and buries Danon's body as best as he can. The next morning, the two wake up to an almost new clearing. Both of them are completely healed of all wounds, new equipment and food is next to them. The hut looks like it had been empty for years, and it seems as if the makeshift grave is all gone. As they walk down a new path, a singing blue bird, which seemed to be so out of place, appears. They end up following this bird every day out of the wilds. Each night it disappears and then comes back each morning. They pass by more wolves, but they do not attack this time. On their journey back out, they find a ruin. After exploring it a bit, they find an ancient carving of what looks to be a dragon's head. Merrick says that he believes this to be an ancient temple devoted to one of the old gods. Eventually, the two make it out of the Kokari wilds and into the western hinterlands. Loghain and Merrick make camp, talking about stories of werewolves that don't really matter to the plot of the story, but eventually the camp is attacked by two horsemen. A fight breaks out, so Loghain and the horsemen are wounded, and more horsemen ride up to them. The leader yells out for them to stop, and Merrick realizes he knows who they are. The leader of the group takes off their helmet and reveals herself to be Rowan Guerin, the older sister of Tegan and Eamon. Shocked that Merrick is alive, Rowan jumps from her horse and punches him in the face. She tells Loghain that she thought he had captured Merrick and the two have an icy first meeting. Rowan and Merrick catch up as to what had happened and we learn that Moria's body had been taken back to Denrim, her head put on a spike outside of the city for all to see. Rowan sends her other men on three horses one way, and she and Merrick and Loghain take off in another towards the rebel base. When Merrick first makes it back to base, the camp is overjoyed to finally have their king. Men and women cry at the sight of him, as he is the hope they have been waiting for. They get to the heart of the camp, and Loghain spots a large, ten-foot-tall creature made of stone spreading the crowd. It appears with a mage named Wilhelm. Yes, that's right, everyone. It's Shale. Not trusting that Rowan found the right person, he goes up to Merrick and casts a spell on him to make sure that he is not enchanted. When the spell fails, there is more cheers. Merrick is whisked away, people saying that it's not a moment too soon, and Loghain, not sure where else to go, follows. Merrick is brought to Arl Rendorn Guerin, general of the rebel army. Rendorn is pleased to see Merrick alive, and Rowan is proud to show her father that she has kept her promise to find Merrick alive. Merrick is taken into a tent to discuss what is going on, but Rendorn stops Loghain from going in, saying that no commoners are allowed. Merrick makes a fuss, saying that he is not a commoner, as he is the son of a knight and the man who saved his life. Rendor then allows him to come in. The Arl then tells them the news. The Orlesian army is closing in on them, and they don't have time for the army to escape. The best plan they have is to take a few good men and escape, leaving the rest behind. Merrick is angered by this plan, as not only was this army the one his mother fought so hard her entire life to build up, but that he doesn't want to lose any more lives on his behalf. Ah, Rendorn and Merrick argue over what to do, but Loghain interrupts, saying that they can win, and he has a plan. Discussion So let's begin with thanking the Artist of the Week. The first did the two drawings at the beginning of Chapter 1, Margra or At Margwa Art. The pictures are absolutely beautiful, and there are a ton more stuff on her Twitter that you should totally take a look at, so for ease of clicking, I've linked her Twitter account in the description box. The second I will have to get to in a bit. 
Anyway, right off the bat, we have a mistake, or at least we do in my copy of the novel. The map on the front of the book has Redcliffe on the wrong spot on the map. It should be at the bottom of Lake Callanhad. For our first user comment, Matilda mentions that her immediate thought was, I now see where Alistair gets his humor from. Reading Merrick's dialogue is almost like having Alistair back sometimes. And I completely agree with her here. While I don't think my summary really does it justice, here is a small section highlighting the famous Theron humor. I saw some more wolves, Merrick announced when he returned with wood. And? Were they hostile? Well, they didn't attack, if that's what you mean, but they were planning to. They told you that. Yes. In fact, they sent a rabbit with a note to inform me of their intentions. He dumped the wood unceremoniously next to the fire. Rather gentlemanly of them, I thought. Loghain ignored him. In Chapter 1, it mentions the band Serolik. We learn that this band is the one of the men who betrayed the Rebel Queen. You might also recognize this name as being the only band in Landsmeet who will always support Loghain. Perhaps because his lands are close to Loghain's. Later, we'll learn that Dragon Age Origins Serolik is the son of Stolen Throne Serolik. An interesting thing to note is what Sister Alice is wearing. Red robes and dwarven glasses. What's interesting about this is that the robes and origins looked more pink and yellow. It really wasn't until Dragon Age 2 that they appeared to be red, so I guess the original intent of the design was what we see today. As for the glasses, we also get a small tidbit by Merrick on how his grandfather used to wear glasses similar to sisters, but more elaborate. These glasses are a note that the doors once again has some of the most advanced technology in Thetis. I also had another note, and as I was writing this section, there was a discussion on Twitter about glasses and Thetis. So from Patrick Weeks, lead writer of the series, the prevailing wisdom is that very wealthy people in very wealthy countries could have them, unlikely for anyone in Ferelden, but an Orlesian or Tevinder noble, possible. This makes me wonder how Sister Alice even got a hold of the glasses. Perhaps she had even come from a wealthy family before joining the Chantry. Speaking of design changes, Sister Alice mentions that Andraste was burned on a cross, something that I have not seen or saw mentioned in other Dragon Age media since. I would assume that this was changed, as then it would be too obvious as what religion the Chantry was based off of. We also begin to see that Loghain outside of Dragon Age Origins would be actually more of a rogue than a warrior, being very sneaky and carrying around bows and daggers. Why this was changed in Origins is unknown, perhaps it's as simple as they wanted to give you another warrior to replace Alistair, or that it speaks of how Loghain was changed over time. Yasht, a frequent commenter that I see around, email me pointing out when Loghain mentions Orlesian mages scrying for them. As far as I can remember, scrying was only ever mentioned in Witch Hunt outside this. I wish they would explain a bit how it works as right now I can think of two ways. Communicating with spirits in the Fade and asking them for information, which seems increasingly unlikely, or looking for specific impressions in the Fade itself. I also remember the mages at Ostagar that were in the Fade and the Templar doesn't allow you to disturb them. If they were scrying for Darkspawn, as the Templar speculated, this may be easier than finding, say, a human, as the Darkspawn are completely foreign to the denizens of the Fade, so they might stand out. I think this is a great point, and how does scrying work in Thetis? In the real world, and I'm not an occult expert, or in really believe in it, but from what I was reading, it's just focused around meditating and focusing on a state of mind or object, and in the state you see images and visions of anything. Often it's used to predict the future, in games it's used to find things, but I bring up the future part because at the very least, Liliana mentions this. Empress Selene is fascinated by mysticism, foreseeing the future, speaking with the dead, that sort of rubbish. So Liliana, who I should remind you has seen some pretty wild things, doesn't believe in predicting the future. With this in mind, I wonder if what Loghain was saying was less about the Orlesian mages literally scrying, but pointing out how desperate they were to find Merrick that they would turn to something that, at least to many, is considered rubbish, or perhaps even believing them to be stupid enough to do such a thing. That being said, when I read it, I took it as meaning that the Orlesians are literally scrying for Merrick, but I find it curious how Thetis' mind has seemed to change about future telling and perhaps this might be a more modern belief. When Loghain and Merrick are walking in the Kokari wilds, it talks about large groups of trees that have been downed. Loghain then states his mind turns to dragons, but they have not been seen in centuries. But there is one dragon in the wilds if you count Flemeth. The novel also talks about other giant creatures, one being giant bears, which you can actually find in Inquisition, and blue-skinned ogres with large horns. 
My questions lie with the ogre, because the ogres we know are darkspawn. As the fifth blight came from the Kokari wilds, were these ogres a hint of what was to come, or is there another type of ogre in these woods? Yash also brings up a good point I hadn't considered. As Merrick and Loghain are exploring the wilds, Loghain notes that the uprooted trees and wonders what could have done such a thing. One of the creatures that he heard lived in the wilds were ogres. So the ogres lived under the Kokari wilds long enough for legends about them to spread into Ferelden itself, and they already knew had a means to reach the surface. Since we know what the Kossuth colony, where the ogre broodmothers presumably came from, was in southern Kukari wilds, this makes me think that all or most of the broodmothers that are still in the area. Which might also explain why there were no darkspawn raids in or out of the wilds, since most other broodmothers would be in the north. They only came south in response to Euthemiel's summons. When Merrick and Loghain are captured, they talk about the Daler speaking in their strange language, and later Loghain remarks that he isn't sure they even speak the common language. This is odd to me, as the Dalish we know can barely speak Elven at all, and the little they do know is broken. This could easily just be Loghain and Merrick not knowing this fact, and the Dalish putting up a front so that the strangers don't know what they're talking about. That being said, the elf they meet talks as if the clan is fluent in Elvish. The Dalish camp is also said to smell similar to jasmine and cooked meats, with the people in this camp wearing colorful clothes of gold, red, and blue, which is unlike the camps we have seen, which have been mostly greens and browns. Now here is where I want to bring up the mysterious second artist I mentioned earlier. I ended up not using this image in the summary section because it has a bit of a backstory. So I've been reading the physical copy of the book, and I also own the digital copy as well. But I got a tweet from FlukasX77 talking about the audiobook. Flukas says that while the narrator is doing a good job, they keep pronouncing the word Dalish as Dalish. I could really do without being hit on the head anymore. Complain to the Dalish. Perhaps they take requests. So this inspired Flukas to wonderfully depict the new Dalish clan inspired by the classic Betty Boop. I love this, and Flukas, and whoever else is listening to the audiobook versions of the novels, please inform me of other terrible pronunciations and just general weirdness. Also, feel free to pick them because this is funny to me. And to see the original image, you can check out Flukas' DeviantArt in the description below. Speaking of version differences, I got an email from Anna, or Anna. Anna Anna, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, she's reading the novel in another language, although she didn't specify which one, but mentions that in her language, when Loghain and Merrick are speaking to the Dalish, Loghain is surprised that they speak the royal language. In the English version of this, Loghain is surprised that the elves know the king's tongue, so I'd imagine that's why it's translated as such. But this got me thinking because I only really remember the common language in Thetis being referred to as common, as did Anna. After a bit of digging, it seems that common is most used by the fans, trite tongue is pretty much only used in the RPG set, and the RPG set also mentions that Ferelden's uniquely call the language King's Tongue, and that is what you see in the novels. As far as I can tell, King's Tongue is pretty unique to the novels written by Gator. As far as the games, I can't even remember the referencing the common tongue at all, and I can't find any myself either. I'm sure that it's used somewhere, so if you know a scene where it's used, please let me know. This is a random detail, but I really like the section of Flemeth having bodies strung up like puppets around her house. To me, it seems to mimic how she actually just treats people like puppets. Yash also mentions something interesting about the bodies around her hut. The skulls along the path to Flemeth's hut reminded me of the ritual that the Jaws of Hakon were performing to hide their action from the gods in the swamp, although I doubt it had the same purpose and it was probably way more advanced. In another good observation, Flemeth is described as an old woman in the book, but Morrigan remembers her as being young once, which suggests she changed her body, or whatever she does, in between. Flemeth also has a really interesting quote that reads similar to her life story we get from Morrigan, but just a little bit more. Fortunes changed, the witch's gaze shifted far off in the distance. One minute you're in love, so much in love that you can't imagine anything wrong ever happening. And the next you're betrayed. Your love has been ripped from you like your own leg, and you swear you do anything, anything, to make those responsible pay. With this in mind, hearing this... She was betrayed as I was betrayed, as the world was betrayed. Mythal clawed and crawled her way through the ages to me, and I will see her avenged! Makes me wonder if this is Flemish story or Mythal's.
Now I mentioned this in Morgan's video, but what was the promise that Merrick made to Flemeth? Too long didn't read, we find out in the comics, after his son is old enough to take over as king, Merrick makes a promise to go find Yavanna and lend his help to reawaken the dragons. That's it. Anna again also questions who or what the bluebird is. She wonders if it was Flemeth herself or perhaps another daughter of hers that we have not seen yet. Which this is a bit random, but after looking at bluebirds, it seems that females tend to not be as blue as I would imagine the bird in question was. So my question here is, would a female maid transforming into an animal always take the female version of that animal? Could Flemeth turn into a bright male bluebird? And if not, if that bird was a transformed male ally or servant of Flemeth, who was it? And while I personally doubt that the two are connected, in the Temple of Mithal and Inquisition, we get to see a lot of fancy birds about, and a large part of those birds are blue. Makes you wonder if perhaps this was the type of bird. Tina on Twitter also linked to me this image of a real blue bird, which I imagine is closer to what Merrick and Loghain followed than the ones we actually see in the Temple of Mithal. This all got me thinking of if there are any symbolism to choosing a bluebird. So I can't think of any other time in the series a bluebird is even mentioned, so I turn to real world examples. Again, I'm not an occult expert, but there is a lot of oddly Christian religious websites that say that a bluebird is to bring happiness in a signal of time of transition to happiness. I also saw some sources say the symbolism is based on Chinese tradition, which makes the Christian connection even more confusing, but whatever the point is, is that this is a transitional period for both Loghain and Merrick, but I don't think it will bring either happiness, so I would wager the choice of Bluebird is more on the distinctive color aspect than the animal itself. There is little to say about the temple that Merrick and Loghain finds. My first thought while reading is that this was going to be an elven temple of Mithal, seeing as the dragon head is there and it's close to where Flemeth is staying. Even though Merrick identifies it as being a part of the old gods, I wonder if he's right. Ancient Deventer took a lot of design tips from ancient elves, so it might be that the temples look similar. And if it is truly not an elven temple, I wonder what old god was being worshipped in the middle of the wilds, and what Flemeth was doing so close to one. I'm saving this for last, but let's also talk about Loghain for a second. Dragon Age Origins treats Loghain like the typical villain up until the point you can recruit him and actually learn his story, but even then he kind of keeps at a distance. As Rachel put it, I always had a hard time fully empathizing with the animosity between Ferelde and Orlay, and specifically empathizing with Loghain's perspective. The first few chapters of The Stolen Throne really helped me understand him and Ferelden so much better by illustrating the horrible things that occurred while Orlay occupied Ferelden. I get why Loghain would never be able to forgive or forget that. It's also enlightening to see the initial wedge between Merrick and Loghain when Loghain's father sacrifices his life to save Merrick, now that it makes the choices he made in DAO any better. I still don't like the guy, but I'm grateful for the insight this gives me into who he is and why. I got another message from Ali the Randomizer that reads, I could never really see how Loghain became Merrick's closest friend. I mean, I figured that he had to have saved Merrick's life a couple times at least, but just from reading the first couple of chapters, I could see that there is so much more to their friendship along with its very bloody beginning. Loghain still chose to protect a king that he didn't believe in and let his own father sacrifice himself. Not only that, but Merrick had saved his life as well when they were brought to Flemeth and what is now Merrick's army. Just from the first couple of chapters of this book, I find myself looking at Loghain in a new light. So we're going to be getting a lot of Loghain-centric comments for the next couple of chapters, which is fine, I love it, and I'll get a few in there a couple times, but it's going to be interesting to see how people's opinions of him waxes and wanes throughout the novel, and I'll be saving my own thoughts until the very end. I also want to talk about the reception of The Stolen Throne. Anna mentioned that she knew someone who thought the book was awful and couldn't finish it, but now that she's gotten to read it, she thinks it's really not that bad. Other comments I've gotten also really enjoy it, and I've heard many times that The Stolen Throne and The Calling are considered to be the best in the series of Dragon Age novels, and in my own opinion, I think the DA novels are all really solid. Except for The Last Flight, that one seemed a little bit clunky, but that's a whole new tale for another video. So for those of you who are reading along, why don't you tell Anna what you think so far of the first Dragon Age novel. And with that, that's all I have on the first four chapters of The Stolen Throne. Our next section will consist of chapters 5 through 8, and please send me your comments, artwork, videos, literally anything by April 8th, 2018. Either comments below, send me an email at gildrathon at gmail.com, or DM, tweet me at gildrathon on Twitter, or PM user Gelanon on Reddit. Dara Sheral.